Hello everyone. Welcome back to English Classes Online. My name is Benjamin. Today's video is on analyzing non-African poetry in the West African Senior School Certificate Examination. And we are going to specifically look at Caged Bed by Maya Angelo, a very interesting poem, a poem that I am really passionate about because I studied uh, African American poetry and uh, literature in general, and I am really passionate about any work of art that reflects that background. If you are new to this channel, kindly subscribe to the channel by clicking on the subscribe button below. Click on the bell icon as well so that whenever a new video is uploaded on the channel, you will be instantly notified. Without much ado, let's dive into the lesson. First, let's take a brief look at the agenda for today's episode. Number one, we are going to look at the poet's background. Number two, examining the structure of the poem. And number three, reading and analyzing the poem. We are going to concentrate on these three major uh, items and we are going to take them one by one. The poet's background. And of course, uh, you need to understand that examining the poet's background is very important. It helps us to understand the poem uh, better. Maya Angelou was an African-American poet and civil rights activist. Knowing her background as an African-American helps us to understand the poem better. It gives us a clearer picture of the images and symbols she uses and the social issues she raises in the poem. Of course, you know that poetry, according to William Wordsworth, an English, a notable English poet, uh, scholar, literary scholar, is the outpouring of powerful feelings collected in tranquility. Every poet, to a large extent, documents their experiences and exp uh, uh, expresses their feelings in the very lines of their poems. Every poet is, uh, expresses their feelings. As an African-American civil rights activist, she undoubtedly experienced the racial discrimination and oppression of the blacks by the whites in the slavery and post-slavery periods in American history. Her autobiography, titled I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, documents her experiences as a working class member of that racist society. Now let's take a further look uh, at her background, more about Maya Angelou. Poet and novelist Maya Angelou, born Marquerite uh, Johnson, he was born on April 4, 1928 in St. Louis, Missouri. Her parents divorced when she was three. You can begin to see her experience. And she and her brother went to live with their grandmother in Stamps, Kansas. When she was eight, she was raped by her mother's boyfriend. All right, so uh, this is a brief autobiography. You can see the, the websites, you know, where you can get the full uh, autobiography. Now, Maya Angelo, by the way, died on May 28th. Uh, May 28, let's get back to that place. All right, okay. She died on May 28, 2014. All right. Her life was never easy. From the time she was born, Maya Angelou was subjected to racism, rape, grief, and dehumanization. 
she experienced enough emotional stress in a time frame that most people don't experience in a lifetime. All right? Yet she prevailed. She forced herself to become stronger, and in doing so, she produced writings which in turn helped others to become strong. Her experiences and the lessons learned gave her confidence to be a teacher, a preacher, and an inspiration to millions. Maya Angelou was courageous. Again, you can find the website here, uh, studyboss.com. That's where this other brief uh, information about Maya Angelou was taken. All right? Now, let's now begin to examine the, the poem. All right? And let's start with the structure of the poem. You know, the poem, Take Bed, is made up of six stanzas, and it has 38 lines in all. It is characterized by run-on lines. Run-on lines, you know, are known as enjambments. Uh, it, is, it becomes a literary technique when it is deliberately used. In grammar, it is known as a grammatical error when you have two sentences and uh, you do not punctuate it well or capitalize it well. It is called run-on sentences. So when you don't make a complete sentence and then you move over to another sentence, all right? So um, this is when the lines of a poem are having a thought that carries over from one line to the next. The, that is run-on line. That is enjambment. You will find that in the structure of the poem the use of enjambment. The poem contains a refrain. In other words, you will find specifically that stanza three is repeated as stanza six. So it is called a refrain. When a section of a poem is repeated, uh, some people call it chorus. In music, you will find a particular uh, stanza uh, that is repeated, you know, as a chorus. In poetry, we call it refrain, all right? Then, uh, a kind of rhyme scheme is noticeable in stanza four, particularly in lines two, four, and six, which end in the words trill, steel, and heel, respectively. When we read through the poem, you will be able to see this. Then we also notice an internal rhyme uh, that can be seen in stanza four, line three. And that is the line that contains the expression and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn. So you can see that there is an internal rhyme here. Dawn rhymes with lawn. All right. So uh, that is about the structure of the poem. All right. Now let's take a look at the title. You know, the title of the poem, Cage Bed, uh, also deserves some analytical attention. The title of the poem, Cage Bed, gives us a picture of confinement or restriction of movement, caged. The word cage means being confined in a cage or being restricted to a cage. A bird is known for its ability to fly by virtue of its wings, but a caged bird is deprived of the freedom to fly. So the title itself already gives us uh, the picture of a creature that is deprived of freedom of movement, all right? Deprived of freedom, freedom of movement which is fundamental, which is part and parcel of its, uh, its nature, the way it is created. A bird is created to fly, but when it is caged, it is deprived, uh, it is denied that ability. It is restricted, it is confined, 
and that is a form of oppression. It is unfair to that bird. All right. So that is what the title of the poem already gives us. Now let's, uh, before we move over to uh, begin to analyze stanza by stanza, I want us to read through uh, Caged Bird, Caged Bird by Maya Angelo. Now let's uh, read through the entire poem and I would like you to watch the movement of the causer as I read through. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful thrill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams, his shadow shouts on a nightmare scream, his wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful thrill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. So that is the, the poem. I want to take the reading for the second time. I love the poem. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful thrill of things unknown but longs for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the tread winds soft through the sighing trees and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams, his shadow shouts on a nightmare scream, his wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful thrill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. Wow, that's the poem for you, Caged Bird, by Maya Angelo. Already we have taken a look at the at the title so let's now take a look at the 
poem stanza by stanza but before we do that i want to show you what i earlier mentioned concerning the structure of the poem you can see that the poem is obviously made up of six stanzas you see stanza one two three four five and six all right and then i told you earlier about the uh, the end rhyme there's a rhyme uh, scheme noticeable you can see thrill steel and heal all right while i was doing the reading i still saw some other you can see breeze and trees all right breeze and trees all right you can see that again well this is near one dreams and scream all right uh, so again here you can see that this is a repetition of stanza three and it is in stanza three we have the end rhyme trill steel and heal and you will find a similar thing you know the exact content of stanza six is the exact content uh, content of stanza three and that is what we mean by refrain a repetition of a particular stanza so i i just wanted to show you the, the aspects of the structure that we earlier briefly analyzed now back to the the analysis now we're going into reading and analyzing stanza one and uh, i want us to really look at it now this is stanza one a free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats down downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky this stanza gives us a picture of a free bird that lives on the back of the wind you can notice that the tone is playful and merry joyful right uh, so it gives us the, a picture of a free bird that lives on the back of the wind and floats downstream and so on. Now the tone of this stanza is playful, happy, and totally fulfilling. The bird is just flying freely and enjoying it, obviously. All right? Lines 1 to 4 describe the best total freedom of movement. Let's look at lines 1 to 4. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing. All right? Oh, well, till the current ends. That's 1 to 4 here. You can see it describes the best total freedom of movement. No restriction whatsoever. Then lines 5 to 7 paint a picture of full assurance of ownership, rights, and privileges through the use of personification, you know, and dips his wing. When we look at it, that is personification. Because here the bed is pictured as being able to dip his wing. And the pronoun he is, which is personal pronoun, used for persons is also used for the bird here and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky another instance of personification now but here we see that this poetic device is used in highlighting the 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 ownership the rights the privileges that this free bird enjoys you know to the extent that he now dares to claim the sky, that, that the sky belongs to him, you know. So that is what we have seen here. So here the bird is portrayed as being able to dip his wings in the orange sun's uh, rays and also being able to claim the sky, which obviously are human 
characteristics or qualities, all right? So that's what we mean by personification. Now let's take a further look at uh, things you should know about this uh, stanza one. All right? Now here the free bed is used as a metaphor to represent the white American communities who had the freedom to live and enjoy all the privileges available to citizens of that country, unlike the blacks in that society who were enslaved and oppressed. Of course, if uh, you have ever read the, the history of America, you will understand their ugly past. There was a time of the slave trade when the black Americans were enslaved and subjected to hard labor on the plantations. All right? and they were oppressed they were they were segregated they were discriminated against they were deprived of all the rights the fundamental rights of citizens all right they were even denied freedom of movement they, 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 they there were no go places for them so the poem uh, obviously portrays the obnoxious era of slavery and its aftermath characterized by lingering racial discrimination against the blacks in the american society that obviously is what the poem is portraying it's a depiction of the racial discrimination that has prevailed in the american society over the years especially during the period uh, in review all right the period uh, when uh, um, maya angelo was born 1928 you know she lived all through those years in the in the 20s 30s i mean 30s 40s 50s 60s these were all the the the, the hot periods of uh, you know very serious oppression uh, of the blacks by the white communities all right who we are obviously in power who we are in control all right and abused their 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 privileges and their power by marginalizing the blacks all right so that is what the poem is about so you will have themes of freedom and and we have themes of oppression themes of racism and so on now let's now look at stanza two reading and analyzing stanza two let me again uh, read through stanza two but a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage his wings are clipped and his feet are tied so he opens his throat to sing all right so here we 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 look at the a, a very uh, dramatic change in the tone of the poem the in stanza one the tone was playful happy and fulfilling but here the tone changes to that of bitterness that of agony that of helplessness all right that of frustration so stanza two of this poem uh, gives us an image of a cake bed contrary to the image of the free bed we have seen in stanza one here the bed is trapped in his narrow cage uh, can seldom see through his bars of rage his wings are clipped and his feet are tied you see all these are aspects of the restriction the deprivation the confinement the oppression the subjugation all right meted out to this bed which of course is a symbol of the black american community now the picture painted of this particular bed is that of a of total restriction of movement deprivation even of the ability to see beyond his bars of rage if you look at the, uh, line three can seldom see through his bars of rage that is lines three and four 
the bird can seldom see through his bars of range of rage all right so that is very great restriction there it even affects his vision all right so having been denied the freedom to fly the only thing this bird can do is to open his throat to sing obviously to voice his frustrations this points to agitation as always the, the last resort for people who are oppressed people who are marginalized people who are the downtrodden the 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 in their helplessness and in their hopelessness and frustration the only thing they can do is to voice their frustrations to agitate for freedom in view of the poet's choice of words like stalks down his narrow cage seldom see his bars of range wings clipped feet tied now in view of this choice of words you know what you need to understand is that the tone of a poem uh, is always uh, is always in sync with the diction the poet's diction or choice of words because if you ask me it is the the the, the words that you use that actually uh, portray or convey the tone all right, so in view of the poet's choice of words, as we have seen, the tone of the poem changes from the previous playfulness and happiness to that of bitterness, frustration, and helplessness. Lines 1 to 6 uh, give a sad picture of total restriction of movement and degradation. So you can see the, the whole stanza gives us this particular uh, uh, up to six you know but a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage his wings are clipped and his feet are tied total restriction of movement confinement all right and degradation as well uh, the life of the bird is degraded is is devalued now, line seven of this stanza two uses personification. Uh, the bird is able to open his throat to sing. And this personification is used to draw attention to a high degree of helplessness and frustration that leaves the victim with no other option except to voice his feelings. So that is exactly uh, what stanza two is about. And again, uh, it is an extension of, you know, the same theme of freedom. We, in stanza one, we saw a free bird, you know, characterized by freedom of movement and also uh, having access to all the privileges, all the opportunities. In fact, that free bird dares to own the sky. All right. So, uh, but here we, we see a clear uh, departure from that freedom and what we find here is complete restriction of movement all right so now the cage bed in stanza two is a metaphor for the downtrodden black american communities during the era of slavery and its aftermath characterized by racial discrimination and oppression like the cage bird, the blacks in that racist society were deprived of all citizenship rights and privileges that their white counterparts enjoyed. Now, we saw stanza one, the freedom, the privileges, the, the rights, the ownership, the opportunities available to the white communities, uh, you know, represented by the free bird. Then in stanza two, we saw the deprivation, the oppression, the, the, the subjugation, the confinement, the, the helplessness, all right, that we are meted to the, the black co uh, communities as represented by the caged bird. So we have seen clearly that the two birds are metaphors. The free bird is a metaphor for the white the, 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 the privileged white uh, American communities, 
uh, while the cage bed is a metaphor for the underprivileged and downtrodden or oppressed black American communities. All right, so let's now proceed to the next. All right, so we are going back to stanza three. Now, reading and analyzing stanza three, let's look at it. The cage bed, well, let me try to. The cage bed sings. All right. So, stanza three, the cage bird sings with a fearful thrill of things unknown, but longs for steel, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the cage bird sings of freedom. All right, so now in stanza three, we are giving a picture of the cage bird expressing his feelings by singing fearfully of things unknown but longed for. You know, the cage bird has not known freedom, just as the black American, uh, the black Americans uh, ha had not known freedom throughout the era in, in, in focus. You know, so the cage bird has not known freedom but it longs for it desperately, all right? So if you look at uh, from line one, the cage bird sings with a fearful thrill of things unknown, but longed for steel. You, the things unknown here belong to, refer to freedom, privileges, opportunities, you know, all those good things, you know, available to the white communities. You know, the, the blacks in that society have not known freedom. All they have known is oppression, just like the cage bird has not known freedom of movement. You know, but because uh, it is inherent in the nature of every creature to, to long for freedom, the bird, as Aelia said, is, is created to fly by virtue of the wings given to it by its creator. Uh, but, but that freedom of movement is already uh, taken away from it. So the bird ha has no option but to sing, to voice its, uh, its desire, its desire for this freedom. The cage bird sings with a fearful thrill of things unknown but longed for still. All right, so that's exactly what uh, we can see here in this particular stanza. The cage bird uh, has not known freedom, but is longing. It, uh, it longs for it desperately. In lines one to four, personification, uh, which of obviously one, two, three, four. All right. Line four, no, I mean line one to four, all right, in lines one to four. Now, personification we can see in line one, the cage bird sings, all right, so the cage bird sings. Now, this personification is used as a poetic device to convey the theme of freedom as a universal need, a natural need that every human being desires and pursues. The use of personification uh, is continued in lines 5 to 8, and you can see it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And his tune is heard, you know, whose tune. So the bird is, is uh, giving human qualities, the ability to sing tunes that can be heard. All right? Uh, so the personification is continued in lines 5 to 8 and his tune is heard on the distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom. Here, the cage bird is able to voice his feelings so loudly that his voice is heard in the distant hill. This underscores the fact that you may deprive people of their right to freedom, but certainly you cannot stop them from 
their natural freedom to express their feelings. And this is where agitation comes in. Don't forget that uh, Maya Angelou herself, from what we saw in her biography, was a, uh, an American civil rights activist. So she was an activist, you know, uh, agitating for, for the rights of the, of the black Americans you know, equal rights with their white uh, counterparts, all right? So uh, she understands the principle of agitation and it is inherent in the every human being. And that is why it is actually incorporated uh, in every country's constitution. You know, every country's constitution spells out the fundamental human rights and one of these rights is the freedom of expression freedom to express your feelings freedom to voice your opinion all right so uh, let's now go to the next stage which is reading and analyzing stanza four all right so let's begin by reading stanza four the free bird thinks of another breeze and the trade winds soft through the sign trees and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn and he names the sky his own. So in line one of this stanza, the poet uses personification again. The free bird thinks of another breeze. And this time, uh, there is a change in the tone, all right? Because it, uh, what we saw in stanza three, is the use of personification to highlight the agony, the bitterness, the frustration, all right, the restriction of movement uh, suffered by the cage bed. But here there's a clear departure. The personification in, in line one, the free bed thinks of another breeze, is used to paint the picture of access to abundance and the freedom to explore new opportunities. The bird is thinking of another breeze, which means there is abundance. You know, the one uh, the bird has enjoyed, it, you know, gives uh, it pleasure. And now he's thinking of another breeze. So there is abundance. There are new opportunities coming up for the whites. But for the blacks, the door of opportunity is closed against them. Now, this is in contrast to the life of deprivation and helplessness typical of the caged bed in the previous stanza. Alliteration is used in line three. Uh, in line three, let's look at line three. One, two, three, you can see. And the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn. You know, worms waiting. You know, alliteration is the repetition of the initial consonant sounds uh, uh, within uh, a line of, uh, of poetry. So here, uh, worms begin with the consonant W and waiting also begins with the consonant W. It's a poetic device. Alliteration is used here. All right, but let's look at it. Now, in, 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 in literary works, we discover that uh, it is not just the poetic device uh, that we ought to look at, but the poetic device in most cases is synchronized with the theme, is used to highlight or draw attention to the major idea being expressed. So alliteration is used in line three, talking about worms waiting, while assonance is evident in, in dawn and lawn in the same line three, all right? So, and we, we can see that, you know, the alliteration here and uh, assonance, they are all aspects of the use of sound. And, you know, when you also look at it, you discover that, you know, sound plays a major role in entertainment. You know, when there is abundance, when there is prosperity, when, you know, when all the rights and privileges available to an individual or group are made available, then, of course, they can think of entertainment, all right? All right, so now let's uh, continue um, 
to analyze this from line one to three of this stanza we see various expressions like another breeze trade winds soft through the sign trees and fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn all these are used to depict the various privileges available to the white community unlike the underprivileged blacks in that society we sorted out the privation in the case of the of the cage bed which represents the blacks again we find another use of personification in line four uh, where uh, the expression is he names the sky his own the bed is portrayed as being able to name the sky his own that is personification this portrays the racist and self-centered mentality of the white community who believe that the entire society and its choice resources belong to them and that the blacks have no right to own the good things of life. So you can see exactly uh, the mentality, the self-centered mentality, the selfishness, all right, uh, of, of, of the of the white, the racist white Americans uh, depicted in this uh, in this stanza. All right, so let's uh, move ahead. Now, reading and analyzing stanza five. But a cage bed stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. Again, we, we look at it here, the final line in each uh, stanza that talks about the cage bed shows us that the final results, the last action, which is the only thing the bed can do, uh, is open his throat to sing and we can see that as a result you know as a result of the of the ex, of the bitter experiences the the overwhelmingly oppressive you know uh, 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 oppressive actions method uh, to this uh, particular bed and so the the result is that the bed results to singing and so singing here is pictured to us as something that someone is doing not as a result of expressing joy but in order to express the bottled up bitter feelings all right now in line one a combination of personification uh, a cage based stance that's one this stands for personification uh, and and metaphor the grave of dreams you know it refers to you know the shattered dreams the desires uh, uh, the the objectives the ambitions of the the black americans that we are literally killed and buried and could not see the light of the day all right now the personification and the metaphor used here are, are meant to underscore the fact that whatever dreams the black Americans had were totally dead, killed by their oppressors who denied them the right to pursue their dreams. So here in verse 1, but the cage bed stands. Now the bed is caged. You can see the oppression here. The bed is caged and being caged, it means it's confined its movement is restricted and that uh, 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 that disables the the bird L makes it impossible for the bird to move to his desired destination or to do whatever he wants to do so the bird by virtue of being caged cannot do anything to achieve uh, his dreams and so he stands on the grave of dreams. His dreams are killed by virtue of being caged. All right, so 
I, I want you to see the picture quite clearly here. The tone of the poem in this stanza has shifted from that of celebration of freedom to that of helplessness and hopelessness. This is achieved through the poet's diction or choice of words like grave of dreams, his shadow shouts on a night mist cream, his wings are clipped and his feet are tied. Now these words, uh, you know, have changed the tone to that of bitterness, that of helplessness, that of oppression. All right. So that is exactly what we find in this stanza. The alliteration in shadow, uh, the alliteration in shadow shouts, again, you can see alliteration here, shadow shouts, you know, the repetition of the initial consonant sounds, I mean, uh, in words. Shadow begins with S, shout begins with S, all right? So uh, that's exactly what we see here. But we are concerned with the sound, uh, you know, the sound, not just S, but the, the sha sound, all right? Shadow, shouts. All right, so uh, that's the alliteration there. But let's, let's look at actually how this, uh, this alliteration is synchronized with the theme. The alliteration in shadow shout in line two has the effect of highlighting the dwindling fortunes and distorted identity characteristic of the enslaved blacks in the white dominated American society. Now you see the, the is standing on the graves uh, on the grave of dreams. The the wings are clipped, the feet are tied. So you can see the gradation, you can see a distortion of one's identity, you can see a total devaluation of one's uh, prestige, one's personality. Uh, all this we can see highlighted uh, through that alliteration. In other words, the shadow is shouting, even though the bird is singing, it's not the real bird that is singing anymore. The bird is now just a shadow of his former self. And because the real identity has been taken away by virtue of the degrading treatment given or meted out to it. Finally, line four continues the personification in which the cage bird has only one alternative available to him, and that is to open his throat to sing. Again, this draws attention to agitation as the only weapon available to the marginalized and the downtrodden in a world characterized by man's inhumanity to man. So as we have seen, the only opportunity left for the cage bird is to open his throat and sing. Uh, apart from that, there's nothing else the, the bird can do. The, the wings are clipped uh, and the feet are tied and it is in a cage and it's restricted totally. So there's nothing the cage bird can do than simply to let its voice uh, ring out. And that is exactly the situation that we find uh, concerning the black American communities. This poem, as we already said, uses metaphor. The cage bird is a metaphor for the black American communities. The free bird is the metaphor for the uh, white American communities. So let's go to the last stanza, and that is stanza six. I read it. The cage bird sings with a fearful thrill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the cage bird sings of freedom. Now, we can see that this last stanza of the poem is a refrain. It is a repetition of stanza three, 
where we were given a picture of the cage bird expressing his feelings by singing fearfully of things unknown but longed for still. The cage bird has not known freedom, but it longs for it desperately. In lines one to four, personification, as we earlier saw, the cage bird sings is used as a poetic device to convey the theme of freedom as a universal need, a natural need that every human being desires and pursues. Everyone wants freedom. No one wants to be caged. No one wants to be confined. No one wants to be restricted. Freedom is a fundamental human right. Freedom of movement, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of ownership of property, and so on and so forth. The use of personification is continued in lines five to eight, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the cage bird sings of freedom. So here the cage bird is able to voice his feelings so loudly that you may uh, that his voice is heard in the distant hill. This underscores the fact that you may deprive people of their right to freedom, but certainly you cannot stop them from their natural freedom to express their feelings and agitate for freedom. So here we see that agitation for freedom is what the, the singing of the cage bed actually symbolizes, uh, you know, singing. Because even in the last stanza, uh, the first, the, 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 I mean, the, the two last lines for the cage bed sings of freedom. The purpose of this singing is for freedom. You know, it, it sings of freedom, and that you know symbolizes the human, the the the, the civil right activism. You know, agitation for the people's right, and people like uh, Martin Luther King, people also like the poet Maya Angelou, we are civil rights activists. They agitated for the freedom of the of the blacks, all right? So that is exactly uh, what we need to understand concerning this poem. Now, having looked at all the stanzas, now let's conclude. On the whole, we can see that the poem uses two beds, the free bed and the cage bed, as metaphors to depict the racial discrimination inherent in the American society of the slavery era and its aftermath. The free bird represents the privileged white American community, while the cage bird represents the enslaved, deprived, and oppressed black American community. Symbolism is an evident poetic device in the poem as the free bird, the sky, the breeze, the trees, fat worms, the dawn bright lawn, and so on and so forth are all symbols which stand for the white American communities and the vast opportunities and privileges available to them. On the other hand, the cage bed, the narrow cage, the bars of rage, wings clipped, feet tied, things unknown but longed for, grave of dreams, shadow shout, uh, nightmare screams, and so on and so forth, are also symbols used to represent the black American communities and their bitter experiences of enslavement, oppression, deprivation, restrictions, uh, confinement, injustice, unfairness, frustrations, helplessness, and uh, hopelessness. So we can see that the poem uses metaphors as very predominant uh, literary device. And we have seen uh, various themes, the themes of oppression, the themes of racism, the themes of slavery, the themes of restriction, the themes of freedom, the themes of agitation for freedom, and so on and so forth. These are the various themes portrayed in this poem. Uh, and this is where we are going to draw the curtain uh, in today's episode. 
uh, I hope you have enjoyed today's uh, video. Uh, we have been analyzing non-African poetry, showing you how you can analyze uh, any of the non-African poems. Specifically, we looked at the cage bed, cage bed by Maya Angelou. If you enjoyed this poem, like the video. If you enjoyed the video, rather, uh, of course, which is about this poem, like the video and share the video with your friends and relations. Those of you who are going to sit the West African Senior School Certificate Examination, the National Examinations Council Senior School Certificate Examination, and other equivalent SSC exams, of course, you will find this poem very useful. You will find the video very useful. I analyzed in, uh, an African poem in the previous video, uh, and there are other videos uh, that have to do with analyzing African literature. Uh, so you will find all of them very useful. Check the description below, and you will find links to the various videos uh, that will be useful to you and then you will have free access to them. If you have not subscribed to this video, kindly do so right now by clicking on the subscribe button below. Click on the bell icon as well, so that whenever a new video is uploaded on the channel, you will be instantly notified. If you have any comments, any concerns, any questions, any suggestions, please leave them in the comments below. Once again, I want to thank you for being part of today's video. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye-bye for now and remain blessed.